been a learning curve and it's been seeing um, family members who were pretty much sliding to the bottom of the pit managed to climb out again and and um, lead reasonable lives. I have one of them who has bipolar disorder, is no longer on medication, has two small children who are delightful, very nice partner, and the other one is thoroughly engaged with her local community and doing good works. I've worked in the Dual Diagnosis Initiative for 25 years, of 12 years in dual diagnosis, 25 years in mental health and 10 in drug and alcohol and working with those people in the margins who suffer from mental health and substance use has always been an interest and has become a passion and continues to be for me. It's very easy to see that if we can get it together to be more effective in responding to people with multiple complex needs, um, there are so many benefits in, just in terms of people's happiness, in terms of, you know, they're leading a life that's meaningful to them. It's a very interesting area. It's an area that brings in a lot of my interests. Um, it's an area that I think as a public health approach is an area where we've really got a, a lot of thinking that we haven't done well um, and perhaps an area that uh, we could um, use more, more outside resources. Um, for me as a clinician and uh, increasingly moving into the research space it means that it's a bit of a holy grail, it's a bit of a, um, unresolved, challenging, very important space for us to keep working and working actively in basically, yeah. Uh, I discovered very early on that the, there was an, a direct link between the two um, and look I've been in dual diagnosis for about eight years but been working within the AOD and mental health field for about 16, 17 um, and never come across somebody that was only one diagnosis so you know, I think dual diagnosis is probably selling it short. My interest in dual diagnosis is it's basically the combination of two very highly stigmatised areas. And it fascinates me that in health, um, we wouldn't approach any part of the health system the way we do with dual diagnosis. So it's interesting how much stigma affects the treatment that people are actually able, able to receive. So if you went in with a broken leg, for example, you get a very different uh, outcome and treatment to if you went in with uh, some mental health issues, for example. Yeah, understanding people in, in not, not, not in so much a black and white way, but in a um, yeah, the many, many different greys, but also, and, but still being able to, you know, implement therapeutic approaches that consider all of those perspectives. So if we look at a Rubik's Cube, it's got lots of little squares, and we can see those Rubik's Cubes as representative of the criminal justice system, um, of uh, health, of finances, of, of housing. Um, it's a combination, because it just does not impact on somebody's um, mental health, um, and a and D use, it affects them in lots of different ways. It affects their family, you know. It can make them itinerant, you know. It can lead to them maybe having a blood borne virus. It can lead them into having contact with the criminal justice system. It can leave them feeling stigmatized, marginalized, uh, misunderstood, not feeling welcomed. So in a sense, it's that complexity. So you have to work with them in a very holistic way.